Hello and welcome to Trading Hour. I'm Surabhi Upadhyay and with me on the show is Reema Tendulkar. And once again, we have a green, green looking screen after hitting those record levels yesterday. The bulls are continuing their strong grip on the market. Uh, for the time being, the Nifty is now nursing a gain of about 80 points. And the leadership sector of the day really has to be IT. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about that. IT obviously is the flavor. It is the next big event for the market. And right now, these stocks seem to be baking in a little bit of optimism after the cool off that we saw in the last two, three weeks. Uh, there's some buying momentum seen, Infosys, a couple of other names, HCL Tech, all of them are up and about. The other good news for the market is that the, the second engine is also firing, and that uh, means banks. So look at the bank nifty. It's up about six tenths of a percent. And uh, some of the major constituents of that up move include an ICICI bank, Axis Bank. So the private sector names are doing well. But even a State Bank of India, for that matter, uh, stocks holding out quite well in positive territory, about half a percent up and about. Uh, if we talk about the losing end of the spectrum, then there's some selling in the auto space. That's quite apparent right now. Uh, Heroes down about one and a half. Aisha is losing some ground. So auto is up, Maruti as well. So auto is seeing some profit taking, but thanks to banks and IT, the overall picture for the Nifty is still looking very, very good. Reliance again is uh, sort of a bit of a disappointment for the bulls, still s s sitting out of the move. Mid-cap market, uh, no problems here. The index is underperforming or slightly underperforming the Nifty, you could perhaps say. The gain is about three-tenths of a percent on the, uh, the mid-cap index. But the advanced decline ratio of the market is very, very healthy once again. You've got about 1,300 advancing stocks and just about, uh, you know, less than 900 declining. So it's still the green line overtaking the red line. So it's so far so good on the broader market screen as well. But like we told you, we will be spending a lot of time talking about the first big trend of the day that's very, very noticeable and that's this uh, buying that's taking place on a lot of the large cap IT names today, including Infosys. Now, Infi has been one of the biggest gainers on the index this morning. And this after an upgrade came in on the stock from Bofa Securities. Nimesh was, of course, the first person to highlight that in the morning just before the opening bell as well. So, Nimesh, let's just revisit this and what is making Bofa optimistic on Infi? Well, Surbhi, I guess uh, apart from the fundamentals, the timing looks quite interesting, right? Just one week before the results, Bofa should upgrade the stock to a buy. They have a target price of 17.85, which potentially suggests a 20-24% upside from current levels. Now, key reasons why they upgrade. One, uh, they believe that the 40% stock underperformance of Infosys versus Nifty since uh, CY22 is, start, is starting to reverse. So that's that's a big call. They expect uh, FY26 revenue growth to uh, to come back to 9% on the back of spending on Basel 3 uh, by banks as well as pending SAP upgrades. So uh, on back of this, uh, they say that the, uh, the, this quarter earnings will be like a will provide a floor or or the or the or the final cut as far as the earnings outlook is concerned. So Bofa has actually upgraded the FY26 EPS by 4 percent. They believe that the valuations appear sensitive to the recovery in earnings. So the key call for them is the recovery in earnings on back of uh, spending going up. And that's the reason why they've upgraded the stock now to buy. And they have a target price of uh, 1785, a potential 20% 20, 20 upside from current levels. Okay, 20% upside is what Bofa expects on Infosys. Thank you for that, uh, Nimesh. Well, IT, of course, is also our uh, big sector in focus today. That is uh, the uh, team on quarter se quarter tak, what we did in uh, Bazaar in the morning. We have now Rima joining in to talk about uh, the overall expectations from Q4. Will this quarter give us any glimmer of hope that things have now moved beyond the worst? Rima, fill us in. Well, you know, the most important to think, uh, thing to track in this quarter's numbers will be the annual guidance from Infi and HCL Tech. Remember, demand recovery expectations have been pushed back. The street is now looking and hoping that things recover at least in the second half of FI25 and then that Accenture guidance further start the sentiment. So expect a cautious guidance from both Infi and HCL Tech. For Infi, the street is working with an FI25 constant currency revenue growth guidance of 3 to 5 percent. For HCL Tech, 4 to 6 percent. But then there are some in the optimistic camp who believe the numbers could be on the higher side. So 2 to 6 percent is the broad range for Infosys. For HCL Tech, it's about 4 to 7 percent. But it's also the pace of recovery which will be monitored. Now, the key question is is the risk of a disappointing or a low guidance at least partially priced in into the stocks? because the Nifty IT index is down 4.5% in the last one month, while the IT, the broad benchmark index, is up 1.5%. 1, 1 so there has been that underperformance. underperformance. Names like Infi down 8% in the last one month. Wipro, for instance, is down 6%. HCL Tech is down 5.5%. 
Also off late, we've seen a few brokerage upgrades on individual stocks. So CLSA upgraded a TCS and HCL Tech to an underperform. They upgraded a Tech Mahindra to a buy from an outperform. JP Morgan to upgraded select stocks. So persistent became an overweight. They upgraded an LTI Mindtree and a KPIT Tech from an underweight to a neutral. JP Morgan went on to say the negative price action over the last one month appears to already bake in some weakness, keeping absolute downsides limited. Again, even though maybe the worst is over, the recovery, remember, will be gradual and back-ended. In fact, there are uh, many who believe on the street that earnings may have bottomed out already in the December quarter or it may bottom out in the March quarter, but the recovery is not going to be immediate. It's going to be a very slow-paced, gradual recovery. Uh, and on the whole, this year in FI25, companies are likely to report a low to mid-single-digit kind of revenue growth. These are the forecasts for the full year, FI25. And as you can see, it's not going to be a good year. Low to mid-single digits is the revenue growth. Now, coming to Q4 numbers, right? The quarter which is upon us. Now, this quarter assumes less of an importance. It's backdated. The street is looking ahead. In terms of numbers, expect TCS to lead uh, the charge here. 1.3% is a constant currency revenue growth forecast on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. The reason why TCS's numbers look up one, because of the ramp up of the BSNL deal. And two, because if you remember in Q3, the management did talk about BFSI showing some signs of green shoots recovery on a quarter on quarter basis. But largely, it's a negative growth expected for Infi, Wipro, and an LTI mine tree. So most of the large caps are going to have a subdued quarter, barring a TCS and an HCL tech, according to the CNBC TV18 poll. This quarter also assumes importance from a CEO change. Uh, remember, Wipro has already announced that Theory uh, Delaporte, the current CEO, will be stepping down before his term comes to an end. They've announced the appointment of Srinivas Palya. So is there going to be a change in strategy under the new CEO? And Tech Mahindra, where the CEO change was already announced, Mohit Joshi has come on board. But what he did say is that the turnaround strategy will be revealed in April. So... Um, if the street is betting on Tech Mahindra's turnaround plans, this is the quarter you need to focus on. For Infi in particular, one word, watch for the possibility of buyback. The last one ended in February of 2023, so they're eligible to announce a buyback. But you know, in a nutshell, Q4, weak quarter, no substantial improvement in the December quarter, but less important. Watch for the FI25 guidance by Infi and HCL Tech and the pace of recovery on revenues and margins. And this finally is the valuation plate. And on an average, Citi is saying the NSCIT is trading at 25 times forward multiple versus a pre-pandemic five-year average of 18 times. Back to you. All right, got that. Uh, Rima, thanks very much uh, for that comprehensive roundup on what to watch. In fact, uh, this was a view that was uh, shared by Ankur Rudra of JP Morgan as well. He also said that uh, we're probably at the bottom in terms of earnings, but the question is, when will that recovery happen? Is it going to be an FY25 recovery or is it going to be a calendar year 2025 recovery? Take a look. Let's look at the scale IT services companies to start with, where ability to grow very, very strongly, especially in double digits, appears to be relatively lower. We think the, the scale IT services companies, companies, let's say above a certain threshold, call it $5 billion or so, can probably grow in the medium, I would say the mid to high single digit sort of ballpark in that sort of range. Maybe they might see one or two years of slightly stronger growth. The second group, I would say, is the larger mid-sized companies uh, across IT services and, and engineering services. Engineering services as a subset, I think that's one subset which has seen lower penetration where growth can be meaningfully higher. We would expect growth there, which currently ranges between high single digits to, let's say, double digits, can be structurally at you know low to mid-teens uh, for at least four or five years. So they can go a bit faster. So, I th you know, we think that what's interesting is in the last two or three quarters, uh, I think what's accepted is that we've seen a significant amount of bottoming out, bottoming out of demand. So to that extent, I think revenue momentum appears to have bottomed out. But the challenge really is that when does this see an upturn? And we don't have visibility of that yet. So while we have seen an element of bottoming out on, on revenue, on demand, the, the visibility of recovery is, is not super clear. And we can, I think the, the confidence on, on bottoming out also is supported by some other factors. I think it's, it's broad, it appears to be relatively broad based. We've seen some uh, recent indicators like hiring indices uh, suggesting something similar. But I think the sort of the, the, the tougher question to ask is an answer is the, is, the, is the timing of the recovery from here on.
All right, so that's the JP Morgan view on uh, IT and what perhaps the quarter and the year ahead will herald. We'll take a quick break on that note. Dreamers, of course, also join me right here on the desk. We will then come back and look at everything that's buzzing in the commodity space. Manisha Gupta will be with us. Welcome back. Let's turn our attention to the commodity space. There's so much action happening there. And uh, Manisha is now with us and talking about precious metals. Uh, well, how much has gold gone up? Every <laughs> single day, it's a new record. It's the next so, number, Manisha. Just tell us the next it's new big number. 71,000 and counting, right? <laughs> it is, it is, yes. You know, but just to remind you that it was uh, a month back that we were six or 7,000 lower from here. So from 63,000 to 71 has been like this. Please tell me you don't have any <laughs> forecast of a one lakh number on gold yet. But I, I have it in my, my various WhatsApp groups, but I'm not talking about no, that. No, no, let's, let's not go there. Let's not go there. And if you are, please, we'll buy gold and keep it then. <laughs> but I've been telling you to buy gold in all of these years. <laughs> sure, true. Well, happy Goody Padma. 15% oh, up in this year. Yeah, years, and today is a day when act people actually come out and start buying. So we're trying to gauge the uh, on-ground uh, impact of the all-time highs in yeah. sense of gold and silver prices. It's going to be quite difficult to see on what kind of numbers do we see. But at this point in time, well, yes, another day and another all-time high is what we are looking at in case of silver and gold. I'll start with silver because this seems to be doing a catch-up with gold because gold ran up much faster, much before, much too sooner. And now silver seems to be catching up. Just to remind you that the international markets have seen an all-time high of silver at $50 an ounce. So we are trading at $28 an ounce right now, which is a three-year highs. But the Indian markets have seen an all-time high at around 82,000 rupees a kg. We have been looking at inflation, constant buying in India, and of course, the rupee depreciation as well. All of that has been aiding rupee run, uh, silver run up there. Interesting also is that for the month of Feb, India has seen record monthly imports coming in for the country. So that tells you that, yes, buying is on the stronger side here. There also is a report from UBS suggesting that $32 an ounce is what you could be looking at in this year as well. If that happens and there are higher targets that we've seen come in from the markets, let me remind you that silver, while of course is a precious metal, it also is a part industrial metal and there is a huge demand for silver in the green energy projects. That is where the demand comes in from. Gold trading at an all-time high of $2,340 an ounce. For gold as well, as we were talking in the last one week itself, we've seen prices gain up by 7% in last one month. We are up by nearly 14% in sense of gold. So strong going there. The latest data that has triggered for the buying is that there are big volumes being traded in Shanghai Exchange. And then China has added gold to its reserves for a 17th straight month for the month of March. The buying that China has done for the month of March is at 160,000 ounces. So it stands now at 72.7 tons of gold reserves in China. China has been buying strong quantities, as I said, on exchanges, uh, uh, officially as in sense of central bank. Retail buying has been on the stronger side as well. So huge support coming in from all of those. Uh, there is global central bank apart uh, from China also being bought. So India, Turkey, Kazakhstan and East European central banks also are buying gold. The markets will now watch out for uh, important data. You have inflation numbers coming in from China and US and the FOMC meeting minutes also come in, in this week. This would give us further direction. At all time highs, I think only central banks can buy gold. <laughs> At least I can't. So no surprise that uh, the PBOC, even uh, the Indian Reserve, uh, you know, Reserve Bank, Indian Central Bank, all the central banks are buying yeah. gold. Buying gold. So should us. So should we? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Waiting for it to correct. All right. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Is very anyone much, talking Manisha. about a correction? Any lower? Everybody levels? is yes, because uh, okay. you know the, what's happening right now is that a lot of shots are getting squeezed. So okay. they're not getting to get out of the market. Is the reason you're looking at higher highs and higher highs and higher highs. Somewhere when it stops, you will see that correction happen. Okay. Basically, All right, Surabhi is going to go to 80,000 and come back to 70,000 and we will be where we are. I am just out of the gold market, guys. I'm placing it on board. <laughs> Thank you very much, Manisha, for joining in today. We do have to take a very quick break on that note. Come back on the other side. Uh, we'll talk technicals. The market is still looking uh, very, very buoyant. Mitesh Tucker will join in with some trading ideas. Welcome back. Mitesh is now back with us for a few technical, uh, you know, trading ideas. Mitesh, uh, any trends that you've observed in the morning so far? Banks are picking up. Uh, the Nifty Banking Index is now up close to about 300 points and is now, what, 150 points? Sorry, 1,150 points away from that 50,000 mark. Uh, your thoughts on the day and the stock ideas? So me. Mitesh, can you hear me? Yeah. 
So I have a buy on Axis Bank. I think that's a stock which is doing very well. Uh, buy here with a stop at about 1,075 for targets of 1,100. Uh, that's the first target, but I eventually suspect the stock could go even higher as the bank nifty is breaking out. And the second stock which I have on my list and I recommended it earlier as well is AU Bank. Buy here with a stop at 632 for targets of 665. Okay, Mitesh, just stay on. We have some more stocks that we want to sort of discuss with you as well. A couple of buzzers that are, uh, uh, you know, uh, moving on the screen today. Let's start off with a uh, couple of real estate stocks which are in focus. So just, Mitesh, allow us a minute because we've got Sonal joining in. Godrich Properties the numbers have been very, very well received by the street. The numbers are looking fantastic. I think they've uh, exceeded their guidance by some 60, 61%, if not, if not more. Sonal, fill us in on the details. Well, it was the highest ever quarterly sales or and the yearly sales that the company has seen as well. And it is the highest that we've seen in the listed universe. The company has been able to beat their FI24 guidance by 61%. So the sales are 61% higher than what they had actually anticipated. In terms of quarterly numbers, the bookings are up 135%. Their volumes are up 52%. And in terms of the annual numbers, their bookings are up 84% to come to 22,500 crore rupees. We spoke about uh, Prestige yesterday. Their sales came to 21,040 crore rupees. If we talk about volumes, they were up 31% as well to come in at 20 million square feet. Uh, they are largely a Mumbai-based player, but their NCR region has done really well, up 180% on a YY basis to come in at 10,000 crore rupees. Their Mumbai sales were at 6,500 crore rupees, which is a growth of 114%. As I said earlier, it's been the highest so far in the reported listed space and looks like it could be um, in terms of sales. So the list suggests that Prestige Estates came in at 21,040 crore rupees, their Signature Global at 7,270 crore rupees. Macrotech at 14,520 crore rupees and Godrish tops the list of all the listed developers who have reported numbers so far. Thank you very much for that. You know, you spoke about beating their guidance. So, Godrish Properties bookings in FI24 stand at 22,500. Their guidance was 14,000. So, that's that 61% beat over the guidance. 22,500 mm -hmm. over 14,000. But Mitesh, uh, which is the best chart in the real estate stocks? See, I think uh, difficult to say which is the best because a lot of charts look very good over here. Uh, but the recent one, you know, which has given a breakout is India Bull Reality. Uh, that could be a good buy with a stop at 135. Look at 160, 165 as the target area. Uh, Gojar's Properties, which was just being discussed, in itself is a good chart. It's run up a bit in the last three days. So maybe you would want to buy it at slightly lower levels. Let's say if you get an entry closer to 26, 40, 50 zones. Keep a stop at 2580 here, and I think upset targets of 2850 can be looked at. So, very, very positive in the short term over here. But yeah, tactically, I think you know you would want to see a mild pullback before you want to buy into most of them. Hmm, okay. Mitesh, stay on. We just again, we just want to discuss the wealth management stocks with you as well, brokers slash wealth managers. Those stocks have been doing really well. I want to start with uh, Anandrati. Anandrati is up 5%. The company is going to be looking at a possible buyback. They have a board meeting coming up on the 12th of this month, and that's when they'll consider a buyback. Stock is up 5% as we speak. And look at the one-year journey of Anandrati. Stock has put on almost 400% in the last one year. It's been absolutely phenomenal. It's not alone. Of course, a lot of the wealth management and uh, you know broking stocks have done when, well, Angel One, uh, etc. Look at that chart. 12 months, spectacular rise on Anandrati. Uh, so that's Anandrati. The other ones are Nuvama Wealth. Nuvama is now surging 6%. Uh, 361 is flat. It was earlier higher, but it's turned a little flat right now. Now, these are two stocks, uh, Novama as well as 361, where Jeffries has taken a positive view of them. So, let's go across to Vamakshi and first understand what is the thesis that Jeffries is going with. Vamakshi? Well, absolutely, and a positive view indeed from Jeffries on both of these counters. And what Jeffries has highlighted is that uh, Indian wealth managers are expected to, uh, to do well, especially in the context of India's economic growth as well as the financialization of savings. They expect that large wealth managers could deliver 22 to 25 percent CAGR in active AUM from FI24 to FI27, and this would largely be driven by net inflows of almost 12 to 17 percent from higher wallet share 
expansion in newer geographies as well as MTM gains. The industry has shifted to full trail model as compared to upfront commissions and this in turn has improved the long term revenue visibility for all of these counters. The share of uh, annual recurring revenue is up to almost 60 to 65 percent of revenues as compared to 40 to 45 uh, to 50 percent uh, share that we saw in FY20 especially in the UHNI segments and this in fact is slated to rise to almost 70 to 75 percent by FY27 so therefore the predictability of revenues is improving. Operational efficiency is also expected to kick in and this will compensate for fee compression. They are expecting leading players to deliver almost 20 to 22 percent profit CAGR from FY24 to 27. So therefore just to sum it up the rise in the share of trail fees is improving the earnings visibility and therefore uh, supports the valuation re-rating that is expected to take place in all of these counters. Given all of those factors they've gone ahead and initiated coverage with a buy rating on Novama as well as 361. For 361 uh, they have a target price of almost 900 per share while for Novama they have a target price of 6000 rupees per share. Madesh, uh, uh, any of them catch your fancy in terms of a trade? Okay, we've lost uh, that connection with uh, Mitesh for now. Here's what we'll do. We'll slip into a very short break. We'll talk about some of these themes with our next guest. So Devang Mehta of Spark Private Wealth Management will be joining in. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Let's get you some corporate opinion now. JSW Energy has raised 5,000 crore via a QIP from Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, GQG Partners and many other marquee investors. Earlier, we had a chat with Sharad Mahendra, joint MD and CEO and Pritesh Vinay, Director of Finance, CFO of the company. Listen in to the management talking about the QIP as well as its arm, JSW Neo. Regarding the QIP, which we recently raised, I think has got a tremendous response. Uh, this is uh, the largest uh, uh, fundraise in la more than last 10 years in the power sector and the third largest in the history of power sector in the country. And uh, apart from uh, the response which we got, which is in excess of three, uh, three times, 3.2 times the response, uh, the participation um, uh, from the global uh, uh, majors uh, has given us a lot of confidence that the market also sees us uh, as an organization which delivers the promises. And as you said that we have already about uh, a year and a half, two years back, we have said that uh, to reach 20 gigawatt of generation capacity by FY30, we are absolutely on track which will result into achieving those EBITDA numbers and PAT numbers of FY30 significantly earlier. We created an enabling structure two years ago by creating JSW Neo Energy and through multiple corporate actions, ensuring that all the green businesses were housed under this one entity. So we created what is called a monetization vehicle, you know, that if and when an opportunity comes, we would have the ability to do that. However, looking at, you know, the, from a relative trade-off point of view, uh, plus another very important criteria that went behind doing a QIP rather than anything else was that in the last two years, we've done extensive engagement with large institutional investors. And a consistent feedback we got is that great business, great management, but very low free float okay. and the low liquidity uh, is becoming a constraint. So an important criteria was also how do we get high quality blue chip institutional investors in our cap table, you know, and QIP would give an opportunity to do that. 
Okay, so that is uh, JSW Energy. Let's move on to one more stock that was literally lighting up the charts yesterday, and that's Exide Industries. It's higher even today, almost 2% up. Now, we know that the company has signed an MOU with Hyundai and with the OEMs like Kia to supply batteries for electric vehicles. That whole excitement that started yesterday, it's, it's continuing today. A lot of uh, brokerages are sounding very optimistic about the prospects of this tie-up. So is here with more details. Sudarshan, so what more do we know now? So first, I'll talk about the news that Exide yesterday announced that company has signed an agreement with Hyundai Kia to supply batteries for electric vehicles. And since then, stock has moved 20%. Just talking about yesterday, the stock was up 17% posting biggest intraday gains since 2006. Now, brokerages have written on the stock. First, Kotak Institutional maintains sell rating and target is to pay 270 per share. It says it maintains sell on expensive valuations, but it expects demand growth to outpace capacity addition in the near term, but high capex intensity and commoditized nature of business to impact return ratio. But JP Morgan is bullish on the stock. It maintains overweight call and target is raised to 480 from rupees 330 per share. It says it is excited by opportunity to step up its penetration of EV battery segment and partnership with a global OEM allays most investor concerns and further order wins could be on the anvil. It increases valuation for EV battery business from rupees 25 per share to rupees 173 per share and raises EV sales target multiples from 1.5x to 3.2x. All right, got it. Thank you very much, Sudarshan. So lots of upgrades coming in and uh, optimistic target prices as well. Uh, they're on XI. Devang Mehta is with us. Uh, he is from Spark Private Wealth Management. Devang, good to have you on the show. So let's start with this whole EV theme, right? Because obviously the market, uh, you know, likes to find interesting opportunities in the space. Uh, you just heard uh, Sudarshan talking about Exide over there. Give us your view on the stock if you cover it or, you know, any other route through which you will pay, play the EV theme in the market. Good morning, uh, Surbi. Thanks for having me on the show. I think uh, happy Gudi, Gudi Padwa to all of you and all the viewers. Uh, happy New to Year. To you too. Yeah. So I think uh, very clearly uh, uh, the EV theme can be uh, can be probably rode by two ways. One, uh, via playing Tata Motors, which a lot of player do, a lot of people do. Uh, it's it's a obvious play on the on the on the uh, India vehicle market, India EV market, where every third car sold is Tata Motors car. Uh, uh, though the majority of the bulk of the revenue still 85% comes from JLR, but it's it's a it's one business which you can probably participate directly. But more importantly, uh, when you want to play proxy plays. Uh, uh, or you want to uh, find out an ancillary play. I think we have been uh, buying this business since the uh, last two, three years, uh, uh, which, which is called Hitachi Energy. Again, not suggesting or giving a recommendation, but uh, uh, this is one business which we have sort of uh, uh, bought, bought in our client portfolios and that has done fabulously well. And it's still uh, going to the EPS for this company is probably uh, going to grow from around 35, 40 rupees to in a couple of years, around say 150, 160 rupees. Uh, uh, this is a demerged entity which came out of ABB, ABB Power Product and Hitachi came uh, and acquired it. It's into every field uh, that is for EV infrastructure or it's into Lumda software, which also uh, sort of uh, differentiates uh, uh, which is the energy or what the source of energy and what is the cost of each energy, maybe thermal energy or uh, or, or, or hydro, hydropower or uh, is it solar power? That also differentiation. It does a lot of important uh, hardware plus software. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a high tech type of a, I can say a capital goods plus a high tech type of a company which lays down even infrastructure for EV. So I think this is this is one interesting play and there are other ancillary plays as well uh, uh, to play this type of a theme. Uh, EV and even the auto segment has done very well. So auto uh, plus EV, if I can say it, it's it's a subset. I think that segment also is uh, uh, doing well and on the back of discretionary consumption improving. Okay, so Hitachi NG is one of your preferred picks. Uh, Devang, real estate numbers continue to look up. Uh, last year, the real estate index on an average was up more than 100%. This year, the Nifty Realty Index is up 25% already. And look at the way the numbers are very, very strong. Uh, beating their own guidance uh, and optimistic expectations from the street. Are you bullish in real estate? Which one do you like? Yes, I think we, we have liked this space, uh, uh, real estate uh, as a theme, uh, as, as we played more through the proxy play of, say, building materials or home improvement or cement has been one of our, our, our top uh, uh, I can say sector, uh, even infrastructure uh, to be to be very fair uh, because a lot of infrastructure is laid out and then real estate has also started to do very well. The last couple of years, uh, you look at these updates uh, uh, for Godrej or look at Macrotech, not this time, but Godrej, I think uh, uh, beat its own guidance by a uh, by huge margin. Look at Shoba, look at Prestige. 
Uh, most of these companies have been delivering on numbers. Uh, the new home sales have been robust. Uh, I also hear about uh, even the old home sales or the, or the, or the resales of uh, uh, flats also happening and, and, and the demand for uh, building materials, uh, be, be it adhesives, be it uh, uh, ceramics, uh, be it a lot of such uh, home improvement themes, uh, even fast moving electrical goods. I think all these companies are becoming a good play. Uh, this is in India, You, if you count this, you have to count it as a, as a, as a more a consumption play. Uh, you can probably uh, count this in infrastructure when, when you are into developed nations. But in India, I think this is more a rising aspiration and people are getting uh, migrated to larger homes. And this is a theme which I think the next two, three years also, uh, probably a lot of people can uh, make, make a lot of money here. Okay, uh, got that. You know, Devang, we were just discussing uh, Jeffrey's note on some of the wealth management stocks once again. This morning they released a very positive outlook on Nuvama and uh, some others as well. So this is obviously a space that, you know, is very close to you. You operate in the, in the capital market sphere as well. So the opportunity or I think, you know, the, the entire landscape, there's no taking away from that. My question is more on current valuations after the run-up in stocks and whether there's still enough left on the table, what would you say? And do you like anything here? So be the space is extremely interesting. And as you rightly said, uh, we operate in the, in the similar space, of course, uh, uh, in the wealth management domain. And uh, honestly, if you if you look at the numbers, uh, uh, from a lot of these uh, companies which have come up with reports, uh, these are very realistic, right? Uh, so when you when you talk about uh, growth at 20 to 25% in terms of AUM growth, uh, and when you when you count this as, as a wallet share, when you count it as a as a, even a new AUM growth, when you count it as mark to market, uh, as well as expansion into new geographies, I think uh, uh, this is this is bound to happen. And we know that we are in a, a wave of financialization where. Uh, sort of uh, there are more and more billionaires, more and more millionaires being churned out. The per capita consumption, the per capita incomes are about to go up. And I think more and more people are now seeking uh, financialization rather than getting into physical assets. Uh, I think this this space is going to grow for sure. This brokerages, be it wealth management, be it AMCs. Uh, I, I probably, if we don't own any business right now in the portfolio over here, uh, yes, we hold, hold certain exchanges as well as uh, uh, some uh, depositories which are also uh, participated in the rally and will do very well from here. I think this is space which will probably come at anywhere between 20 25 percent uh, for the next three five years if not more mm. uh, you know today uh, Devang Bofa came out with a note on Infosys uh, and they've raised the target price to 1785 it's gone through a long period of underperformance and it's the best leveraged play for a demand recovery when it comes to IT services in the IT pack which one do you like and would you bet on Infosys I think yes, one one uh, sector which is sort of been been left out is is is, is IT and then uh, a bit of pharma, bit of pharma. I can say not the entire pharma space. Uh, why? Because yes, naturally there were there were there were earnings uh, difficulties for this sector. There were margin uh, pressures for this sector. The guidance was not as great. But I think uh, uh, the economy facing companies did its own uh, uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, I think IT should come back. Uh, probably the guidance seemed to be improving last quarter. Yes, we saw a couple of misses from Accenture where the guidance was uh, sort of lowered. Uh, maybe I think. Uh, we are very keen to watch uh, this time's body language and, and the guidance. Uh, I, I think probably the sector seemed to have bottomed out if US is doing extremely well, if Europe is coming back uh, from, from a bit of hibernation. I think this sector is one sector which would be dark horse. If somebody wants to make, say, 15, 18, 20%, I think there are a lot of mid-cap IT companies. But for large cap like Infosys, TCS, anywhere between 10 to 15% is a realistic sort of return. If that is the horizon for the next two, three years, that's the return expectation. I think that's uh, very fair to expect it from companies like Infosys and TCS. Okay, by the way, Devang, you know, on the screen, there's some good news that's flashing when it comes to the weather gods and the monsoon outlook. So the SkyMet outlook is out, the official forecast, and they're forecasting a normal monsoon for uh, the current year. And they're, uh, yeah, that's 102% of the long period average. And not just that, they're saying that the, uh, you know, El Nino conditions are very quickly changing to La Nina. And we know that La Nina is supposed to be very favorable for uh, monsoon. So perhaps as we get further down the season, uh, perhaps July, August is when the favorable La Nina conditions will kick in. So maybe a bountiful monsoon uh, should be upon us this year. So Devang, uh, you know, I'll make that my last question. Everyone's been talking about the rural recovery. There's elections. And if we get a great monsoon, then uh, how would you look at uh, rural plays? I mean, is that a theme you'd, you'd consider? And then again, the top stocks that you will uh, play that via. Yeah, we've been, we've been looking at this theme. In fact, uh, rural... Uh... Uh, recovery uh, can be played via two, three themes. One, yes, auto. A lot of these companies like Maruti and companies like Aisha and Hero sell a, a large part uh, of their of their uh, of their products uh, into rural market or the hinterland of India. So this is one interesting sector which also benefit auto companies. Yes, tractors are benefited. Uh, there are a lot of agrochemical companies which already are are trying to show. 
uh, that sort of a uh, of, of a recovery uh, and, and are, some of them are touching life eyes companies like pi industries and all uh, went through a phase of hibernation but again as as uh, you rightly said el nino uh, transferring to say lanina uh, i think uh, important times for markets probably april may june we would get to see uh, the uh, the stability in terms of political stability whether it we achieve that uh, uh, the important elections and in june july august yes we need to see the progress of monsoon as well i think so interesting times ahead with earnings season just starting in the next uh, uh, i think couple of days and uh, updates are good as well so probably yes i think uh, uh, agrochemical auto tractors are one theme which one can probably uh, keep in the in the in the bucket list if, if monsoon is going to do well okay all right uh, devang we'll leave it on that note thank you very much for joining in today good chat as always well with that we do have to take a very quick break we'll come back on the other side and uh, we get you some more q4 previews this time we'll focus on the consumer discretionary space we'll have karan torani of elara joining in Welcome back here with us on Trading Hour, and as promised, let's get that, uh, get to that uh, thematic discussion with Karan Thorani of uh, Ilara Securities. Uh, he's come out with a note talking about the expectations that we can have from consumer discretionary companies in the fourth quarter, and uh, uh, Karan has uh, bucketed them into three categories: alcoholic beverages, Alcobev. Uh, the QSR space and also uh, beauty and personal care. I mean, uh, quick commerce, uh, something like uh, Nike. Uh, Karan, great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for joining in. So let's start first with you know your overall trends because the whole narrative in the market has been that discretionary consumption has been doing much better. Uh, the you know uh, the analysts who track staples anyway are telling us don't expect anything big by by way of volumes or or even a recovery. So, on discretionary, in general, are you expecting any pleasant surprises tucked in anywhere? Hi, sir. Very pleasure to be here. Uh, so, I think on the discretionary side, uh, definitely, you know, volume growth has been slightly better, but uh, it really depends in terms of what segments are we talking about. So, in the case of beer, I think we'll see strong volume growth for UBL, close to about eight, ten percent. Uh, you know, on the alcohol side of the spirits, which is United Spirits. The prestige and above will grow by about three, four percent. Radico and prestige and above volumes will grow by about fourteen to fifteen percent. So I think selectively volume growth has been very strong for the alcohol segment uh, versus last year. Uh, if you look at QSR, I think there there is a problem. I think uh, all the companies are going to report an SHG decline in the range of about three uh, percent to fifteen percent. Where in pizza category, specifically Pizza Hut, will be at the higher end of this band. And if you look at fried chicken, they'll see a decline of about two to three odd percent. So I think fried chicken will see some kind of outperformance versus the pizza category. Uh, as far as Nike is concerned, you know, because the company is online, I think the BPC category growth is about twenty-five to twenty-eight uh, percent, which is also strong. So I think it's a mixed bag. I think except QSRs, uh, if you look at online BPC and if you look at Alcobev, I think there's strong volume growth in this quarter. Mm. uh while qsr is weak quick commerce is booming you know blinkets numbers are only getting up and that's pushing up the valuation for zomato talk to us about zomato because it's, you know the you know when you speak to people outside they're saying the total addressable market for blinket uh, and that's going to be the value driver for zomato going ahead is so wide like today they're doing you know some grocery some essential goods here and there but they can take on an amazon and flipkart uh so talk to us about zomato and how you see this over the longer term so i think the quick commerce space has been quite exciting uh, i think what we've seen in the last six quarters is very superior execution by blinkit uh, everything you know in terms of higher orders uh, per store which is higher throughput also in terms of you know cost rationalization also in terms of multiple margin levers so margin levers they've got two levers uh, one very big lever that they have is product mix chain so they are trying to focus more on ppc product uh, other retail products you know which are high margin nature uh, even apparel for that matter is something which what they've started by recently and second of course is advertising revenue so blinkit as a platform can cater to a wide range of advertisers as compared to zomato which would appeal only to food business advertisers so that's another very big lever as far as profitability is concerned i think uh, they are potentially on track to get a break even by about q1 fy25 so i think basis execution uh, blinkit valuations you know have been moving up and to your question in terms of the addressable market so i think quick commerce market is only about 2% of uh, india's e-commerce market uh, potentially with the kind of growth and offtake that we've seen right now 
uh, it can move to almost about 4% of India's e-commerce market over the next two to three years because there's a strong potential for about 70-80% KGA growth in this segment. Uh, also, one more interesting thing in this segment is that many of the companies have also tried loyalty programs and loyalty programs will lead to better AOV as well. So, you know, if you look at the grocery segment or the FMCG segment or the staple segment rather, the contribution uh, on quick commerce platforms from this category was about 80-90% which has now come down because beauty, personal care, and uh, apparel and other non-food uh, segments are also doing well over here. Uh, you know, I just want to go back to that point that you made on QSRs, uh, Karan, and that pain has been ongoing for several quarters now. And if I heard you right, I mean, you were saying that same-store sales could uh, decline by anywhere between 3% to 14% for the players this time around. So, uh, I mean, any light at the end of the tunnel? And a related question... That uh, because the going has been so difficult, obviously stocks haven't gone anywhere. I mean, is, is this the time to try and bottom fish? Or do you think it's still, uh, you know, difficult out there and you'd better be off in other um, consumer stocks? I think they're selectively positive on the QSR side. Uh, as we said, you know, we have a positive stance on companies like Devyani and Sapphire. Uh, because 80 to 90 percent of these companies' valuations are driven by KFC. Uh, so we believe that in terms of potential recovery, in terms of potential growth rate, both in terms of SEC and in terms of store edition, uh, you will see better growth for KFC and which will have a benefit for Devyani and Sapphire. So we are certainly positive on those names. I think pizza as a category or rather burger as a category, there are still concerns. Uh, the market is quite fragmented. The competitive intensity is only increasing. Uh, especially, you know, for pizza, their major clout in the pre-COVID times was delivery. Uh, which now stands to be disrupted. Right now, it's kind of democratic. You know, anybody can just open a pizza chain and you know, piggyback on Zomato and uh, you know, uh, have got delivery volumes uh, in terms of their revenue. So I'm saying the pizza space, unless we don't see competitive intensity cooling off, uh, I don't see any respite over there. Uh, burger as a category is somewhere between fried chicken and pizza, but burger, again, is seeing competitive intensity uh, with new players coming in. So a lot of offtake has happened from cloud operators, new players. Uh, two, three things have happened here. Even the customers have kind of you know, adopted to new players. Customers are open to trying out. Customers are willing to try out products from these new players, which was not the case earlier four years ago. So my point is that global QSR chains, uh, except for the fried chicken category, uh, are under pressure because of heavy competitive intensity. So you like Devyani and Sapphire. What is your target price and how do the valuations stack up for these compared to what we've seen, say, a year ago or three years ago? So typically, why we like Devyani and Sapphire? Because both these companies, firstly, in terms of SEC, they, are, they could report an outperformance versus pizza category. And this outperformance is a big one. It could be almost about 2 to 3% higher growth on SEC versus pizza as a category. The second thing is store growth. So, you know, pizza as a category would have store growth of about 8-9%. Uh, because fried chicken is underpaid in India, there's a big opportunity over there for fried chicken to expand. You could see store growth of 10 to 15% for this category. The third thing is profitability. So if you look at Jubilant for that matter, you know, off lately they've announced free delivery on their app and that will impose margin pressure. Plus, Pizza as a category is investing very aggressively in terms of value offers and, you know, promotions and everything put together, which is kind of diluting the margins. So even from profitability standpoint, I think they are right now on par with Jubilant and probably could, you know, emerge higher from here on because of the growth in the category that they're seeing. So putting all these things into perspective, we believe that, you know, this company could trade at a 25-30% premium uh, versus Jubilant or, uh, you know, the pizza category as such. So we've been a target EBA beta multiple of about 38 to 40 times for both these companies uh, as compared to Jubilant, which is around 31 times target EBA beta F26. Mm, so pizza is not that hot. Maybe fried chicken is better off from an investor standpoint. Uh, just to dial back to Alco Beverages, where we started, Karan, you said that the beer category is, is seeing the best growth. Uh, I think 8 to 10% for UB, you said. Now, again, just from a risk-reward basis in terms of picking stocks, uh, how do you see USL? What about Radico? Uh, just give us some sense on uh, also margin trends, what we can expect. I, I think you're expecting some margin compression for a lot of Alcobev com companies as well. So, uh, you know, just what we can expect and your topics here. Right, so, from a growth standpoint, I think UBL has uh, been the most aggressive. I think, uh, you know, with the new CEO joining, uh, they have gained market share in some markets in the North India. Uh, you know, they had lost market share in the Kingfisher category, which is the regular beer category, until about a year back. And they have seen pressure from local players like so many certain selective markets. 
So that issue seems to be arrested. So versus last year's base, you know, you will see market share gain and better volume growth for UPL. Uh, as far as uh, UNSP and Radico is concerned, I think UNSP volume growth is slightly muted at about 4 odd percent, 4 to 5 odd percent. Unless we don't see, uh, you know, this volume growth moving towards 7 to 8 percent or probably outperforming industry averages, you know, you will not see derating on the stock because the stock is at about 53, 54 times core alco by business. So we don't like UNSP in this space, but yes, UPL. Uh, is a momentum play, but UBL, I think, again, at these valuations, it is fair. Uh, I don't find the valuation to be attractive because margin is a big issue here. They are investing aggressively in the beer category, investing aggressively in terms of expanding market share in the premium beer, which is Heineken. So I think basis that you see margin pressure and margins are at a big gap versus pre-COVID levels. Pre-COVID EBITDA was about 14, 15%. They're at about 8, 9% EBITDA. So I think unless we don't see that recovery on EBITDA margin, we won't see, you know, upgrades as far as UBL is concerned. So selectively, I think uh, we prefer Radico the most here. Again, the valuations are not very cheap or attractive, but this is a very good compounding story wherein you can have uh, 15 to 17 percent of volume growth, 20 plus uh, percent uh, revenue growth in the PNA category, and overall revenue growth of 15 percent plus with an improvement in margins because Radico has also done back to integration and they are somewhere protected with this higher ENA cost. So I think gross margin wise uh, or rather commodity wise, QSR companies, Alcobef companies, all of them are seeing some kind of a respite, but not all of them will see expansion or EBITDA margin because most of the companies are investing in terms of promotion, sales, marketing, and uh, in discounts and value offers. Got it. Fair enough. Uh, that's the takeaway. Watch out for uh, perhaps decent volume growth on the Alcobev side. QSR, the pain is continuing. Uh, that's the verdict coming through. Karan, thank you very much. Very helpful discussion as we gear up for earnings. Thanks for joining us on the show today. We'll take a break on that note, come back on the other side, and uh, we will, of course, uh, you know, get you more on the markets. Also, we have an announcement to share with you. We are launching CNBC TV 18's first ever live personal finance webinar, CNBC TV 18 Accelerate, a personal finance handbook with Sonia. She will be joined by three well-known experts on Saturday, the 11th of May, 9 a.m. onwards. We'll be diving into everything you need to know to master your finances and learn how to grow your wealth, insurance tax saving, managing your portfolio, retirement planning. There's lots to learn. Whether you're in your 20s, 30s or 40s, this live webinar is for you. We have limited seats, so don't miss this chance to register now. Scan the QR code to register or log on to cnbctv18.com. Welcome back here with this on Trading Hour. Now, the March uh, month end, and of course, the fiscal year, FI24, and general insurance business data is out. Yash is here with the details. Yash, fill us in. How have the general insurers done? Well, it should be very strong numbers for ICICI Lombard. You speak about the month of March, fourth quarter, or FI24. ICICI Lombard has topped the charts when it comes to premium collection numbers. Uh, for the company, in the month of March, the premium collection has grown by 18%. In the fourth quarter, it's grown by 22%. And again, 18% growth for FI24. This is almost double of where the industry average stands at this point of time. There's also a market share addition for ICICI Lombard uh, to the tune of about 37 basis points. For New India Assurance, it's been a tough year for the company. March premium have uh, remained flat. In the fourth quarter, the premium have grown just by about 2%. In FI24, there's a growth of about 7%. Market share loss of about 64 basis points for New India Assurance. Star Health Insurance, the numbers look decent, but they've continued to underperform the industry average. So March premium for Star Health have grown at 18%. Q4 premium and FI24 premium also growing at the pace of about 18%. Uh, the bigger concern for Star Health though is on the market share front because when you compare Star Health to other standalone health insurance companies, Star Health has lost about 330 basis points of market share uh, in FI24. So of course losing market share is one concern apart from uh, you know underperforming the industry average. Okay, thank you very much for that. Let's turn our attention back to the global market and hear out U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who's optimistic on the U.S. economy. In an exclusive conversation with CNBC, she says inflation will come down and the Fed will consider cutting rates once inflation is in its comfort zone. U.S. is firing on all cylinders. I mean, in terms of short-term performance, inflation is coming down. The job market is very strong. Growth has um, really been a lot stronger than I would have expected at this 
at this stage. We had 3.1% growth last year. Inflation's coming down. Um, labor supply is up. And um, we're seeing some of the pressures we, we might worry about coming from the labor market impacting inflation. They're subsiding, but unemployment remains very low. You're still confident we are this year? Well, I think it will continue to come down over time. That's my expectation. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we, we can certainly get into the twos. The Fed has indicated that um, they want to make sure that inflation's really coming down and that they're obviously considering rate cuts that would be appropriate when they reach that judgment. And we've had generally good news on inflation. Um, you know, let's look at the data. I believe inflation will continue to come down. I think th we've got a good, strong economy. We've got very strong domestic demand. Um, consumers are holding up. Our financial system is generally quite strong. Um, I don't, it, it, things can always happen. There's always recession risk. Geopolitical developments could um, create risk to our economy. But I think we've got a good, strong economy that's on a solid track. Okay. Uh, one of the stocks which is doing very well today is Sterlite Industries. Just pull up that stock. It's up close to about 12%. But this follows um, a long period of underperformance. In the last one year, while you know the rest of the market has boomed, Sterlite Tech price is down nearly 10%. This is the last one year performance, if you could pull that up. And one of the key reasons is the company has been sitting on very high debt. They want to bring it down. So this QIP money that they're looking to raise, 800 crore base issue plus 200 crore of an upsize option, totally amounting to 1,000 crore rupees, will go in deleveraging their balance sheet, and that will be a positive. Uh, you know, their finance cost in Q3 was about 94 crore, which compares with an EBITDA of 109 crore. So finance cost is a big problem for the company, and this deleveraging, once they raise their money, will help. Also, the company's financials have been weak. You know, they've been hit on account of demand headwinds in parts of US and Europe. And the company had said that in FY24, their revenues will decline. We're talking about STL, Sterlite Technologies Limited, which is uh, you know higher by close to about 12 to 13 percent as the street is looking forward to that QIP. Though it will entail a very large dilution because the market cap of the company is 5,000 crore rupees and they want to raise a total of 1,000 crore rupees. But uh, that's about you know one particular stock, Sterlite Tech. The markets are holding up fine. 80 points up on the Nifty, Sensex up 300 points. Banks are soaring. Uh, the Nifty Banking Index is now 350 points up at the day's high. Let's get you some more opinion that we got earlier today from Prateek Gupta, CEO and co-head of Institu Kotak Institutional Equities. Um, he spoke about what the foreign investment view is on India, how are FIs in, you know, viewing India, and when will they start perhaps entering the Indian market? Uh, as far as foreign investors are concerned, they still like India from a medium-term perspective in our interactions with global investors around the world. Uh, uh, from a longer-term perspective, everybody is extremely positive. But uh, but as far as India is concerned, everybody is positive, except they're just sort of holding back for the time being, either waiting for a market correction or waiting for some events to get more clarity on the earnings outlook. The U.S. Fed starts uh, cutting is likely in the second half of this uh, calendar year. Uh, that is one potential trigger, which typically means a weaker dollar and money flows into emerging markets. So that time you will see, uh, you know, EMs like India in particular get a disproportionate share. All right. And with that, we are out of time on this edition of Trading Hour. Thank you very much for uh, watching. Do stay tuned. Halftime Report comes up next.